chapter 8. I don't want to promise we'll finish the chapter of this episode, but we might. <coughs> I've learned my lesson about promising that. <coughs> we'll see. If you like what you see, hit the like and subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you get notified when I make a new video. Let's dig in. Annihilation unto total surrender. The U.S. Army's Search and destroy missions and forced relocations, ethnic cleansing, in the West are well documented but perhaps not normally considered in the light of counterinsurgency. Marie Sandos recorded one such story in her 1953 best selling work of non fiction, Cheyenne Autumn on which John Ford based a 1964 film. In 1878, the great Cheyenne resistance leaders Little Wolf and Dull Knife Dull Knife has to be a, a slap in the face kind of name, right? Little Wolf and Dull Knife led more than 300 Cheyenne civilians from a military reservation in Indian Territory where they had been forcibly confined to their original homeland in what is today Wyoming and Montana. They were eventually intercepted by the military but only following a dramatic chase covered by newspaper reporters. <clears throat> so much sympathy was aroused in eastern cities that the Cheyennes were provided a reservation in a part of their original homeland. A similar feat was that of the Nimi Ipu Nez Perce tribe under Chief Joseph. Sorry if I mispronounced that. And the Chief Joseph who tried to lead his people out of military incarceration in Idaho to exile in Canada. In 1877, pursued by 2,000 soldiers of the U.S. Cavalry, <sighs> led by Nelson Miles, Nimi Ipu'u led 800 civilians toward the, the Canadian border. They held out for nearly four months, evading the soldiers as well as fighting hit-and-run battles while covering 1,700 miles. Wow. Some were rounded up and placed in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, but they soon left on their own and returned to their Idaho homeland, eventually securing a small reservation there. The longest military counterinsurgency, <coughs> counterinsurgency in U.S. history was the War on the Apache Nation. 1850 to 1886, Goyathle, known as Geronimo, famously led the final decade of Apache resistance. The Apaches and their Diné relatives, the Navajos, did not miss a beat in continuing resistance to colonial domination when the United States annexed their territory as a part of the half of Mexico taken in 1848. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo between the United States and Mexico, which sealed the transfer of territory, even stipulated that
that both parties were required to fight the savage Apaches. Savage Apaches. By 1877, the army had forced most Apaches into inhospitable desert reservations, led by Geronimo Chiricahua Apaches resisted incarceration in the San Carlos Reservation designated for them in Arizona. When Geronimo finally surrendered, he was never captured. The group numbered only 38. Most of those women and children, most of those women and children, with 5,000 soldiers in pursuit, which meant that the insurgents had wide support both north and south of the recently drawn U.S.-Mexico border. Guerrilla warfare persists only if it has deep roots in the people being represented. The reason it is sometimes called people's war. Obviously the Apache resistance was not a military threat to the United States, but rather a symbol of resistance and freedom. Herein lies the essence of counterinsurgent colonialist warfare. No resistance can be tolerated. Historian William Appleman Williams aptly describes the U.S. imperative as annihilation unto total surrender. Geronimo and 300 other Chiricahuas, who were not even part of the fighting force, were rounded up and transported by train under military guard to Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida to join hundreds of other Plains Indian fighters already incarcerated there. <clears throat> Remarkably, Geronimo negotiated an agreement with the United States so that he and his band would surrender as prisoners of war rather than as common criminals as the Texas Rangers desired, which would have meant executions by civil authorities. The POW status validated Apache sovereignty and made the captives eligible for treatment according to the international laws of war. <clears throat> Geronimo and his people were transferred again to the army base at Fort Sill in Indian Territory and lived out their lives there. The US government had not yet created the term unlawful combatant, which it would do in the early 21st century, depriving legitimate prisoners of war fair treatment under international law. During the Grant administration, the United States began experimenting with new colonial institutions, the most pernicious of which were the boarding schools modeled on Fort Marion Prison. In 1875, Captain Richard Henry Pratt was in charge of transporting 72 captive Cheyenne and other Plains Indian warriors from the west to Fort Marion, an old Spanish fortress, dark and dank. After the captains were left shackled for a period in a dungeon, Pratt took their clothes away, had their hair cut, dressed them in army uniforms, and drilled them like soldiers. Kill the Indian and save the man was Pratt's motto. This successful experiment led Pratt to establish the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania in 1879, the prototype for the many militaristic federal boarding schools set up across the continent soon after augmented by dozens of Christian missionary boarding schools. The decision to establish Carlisle and other off-reservation boarding schools was made by the U.S. Office of Indian Affairs, later renamed the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA. The stated goal of the project was assimilation. Indigenous children were prohibited from speaking their mother tongues or practicing their religion while being indoctrinated in Christianity. As in the Spanish missions in California and the U.S. boarding schools, the children 
were beaten for speaking their own languages, among other infractions that expressed their humanity. Although stripped of the languages and the skills of their communities, what they learned in boarding school was useless for the purposes of effective assimilation, creating multiple lost generations of traumatized individuals. Just before the centennial of U.S. independence in late June 1876, then-Lieutenant Colonel Custer, commanding 225 soldiers of the 7th Cavalry, prepared to launch a military assault on the civilians living in a cluster of Sioux and Cheyenne villages that lay along the Little Bighorn River. Led by Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, the Sioux and Cheyenne warriors were ready for the assault and wiped out the assailants, including Custer, who after death was promoted to general. After death was promoted to general. I guess that was his last stand, too. The proud author of multiple massacres of indigenous civilians, starting during the Civil War with his assault on unarmed and reservation incarcerated Cheyennes on the Washita in Indian Territory. Washita, Washita. <clears throat> Custer died for your colonial sins. In the words of Vine Deloria Jr. A year later, Crazy Horse was captured and imprisoned, then killed trying to escape. He was 35 years old. Crazy Horse was a new kind of leader to emerge after the Civil War, at the beginning of the Army's Wars of Annihilation in the Northern Plains and the Southwest. Born in 1842 in the shadow of the sacred Paha Sapa, or Black Hills, he was considered special, a quiet and brooding child. <clears throat> Already the effects of colonialism were present among his people, particularly alcoholism and missionary influence. Crazy Horse became a part of the Akisita, a traditional Sioux society that kept order in villages and during migrations. It also had authority to make certain that the hereditary chiefs were doing their duty and dealt harshly with those who did not. Increasingly, during Crazy Horse's youth, the primary concern was the immigrant defilement of the Sioux territory. A steady stream of Euro-American migrants clotted the trail to Oregon territory. Young militant Sioux wished to drive them away, but the Sioux were now dependent on the trail for supplies. In 1849, the army arrived and planted a base, Fort Laramie, in Sioux territory. Sporadic fighting broke out, leading to treaty meetings and agreements, most of which were bogus army documents signed by unauthorized individuals. Crazy Horse was a natural in guerrilla warfare, becoming legendary among his people. Although Crazy Horse and other militants did not approve of the 1868 U.S. Treaty with the Sioux, some stability held under Custer's soldiers found gold until Custer's soldiers found gold in the Black Hills. Then a gold rush was on, with hordes of prospectors from all over converging and running rampant over the Sioux. The treaty had ostensibly been a guarantee that such would not occur. Soon after, the Battle of the Little Bighorn put an end to Custer, but not to the invasion. Indigenous peoples in the West continued to resist, <clears throat> and the soldiers kept hunting them down, incarcerating them, massacring civilians, removing them and stealing their children to haul off to faraway boarding schools. The Apache, Kiowa, Sioux, Ute, Kickapoo, Comanche, Cheyenne, and other nations were attacked, leaving community after community decimated. 
by the 1890s, although some military assaults on indigenous communities and valiant indigenous armed resistance continued, most of the surviving indigenous refugees were confined to federal rev reservations. Their children transported to distant boarding schools to unlearn their indigenousness. Ghost dancing. Disarmed, held in concentration camps, their children taken away, half starved. The indigenous peoples of the West found a form of resistance that spread like wildfire in all directions from its source thanks to a Paiute holy man, Waboka, in Nevada. Pilgrims journeyed to hear his message and to receive directions on how to perform the ghost dance, which promised to restore the indigenous world as it was before colonialism, making the invaders disappear and the buffalo return. It was a simple dance performed by everyone, requiring only a specific kind of shirt that was to protect the dancers from gunfire. In the 20th century, Sioux anthropologist Ella Deloria interviewed a 60-year-old Sioux man who remembered the ghost dance he had witnessed 50 years before as a boy. Some 50 of us, little boys about 8 to 10, started out across country over hills and valleys, running all night. I know now that we ran almost 30 miles. There on the Porcupine Creek, thousands of Dakota people were in camp, all hurrying about very purposefully in a long sweat lodge with openings at both ends. People were being purified in great companies for the holy dance, men by themselves and women by themselves, of course. The people, wearing the sacred shirts and feathers, now formed a ring. We were in it. All joined hands. Everyone was respectful and quiet, expecting something wonderful to happen. It was not a glad time, though. All wailed cautiously and in awe, feeling their dead were close at hand. <clears throat> the leaders beat time and sang as the people danced, going round to the left in a sideways step. They danced without rest, on and on, and they got out of breath, but still they kept going as long as possible. Occasionally someone thoroughly exhausted and dizzy fell unconscious in the center and lay there dead. <coughs> but not really dead. Quickly those on each side of him closed the gap and went right on. <coughs> After a while many lay about in that condition. They were now dead and seeing their dear ones. As each one came to, she or he slowly sat up and looked about, bewildered, and then began wailing inconsolably, inconsolably. Waking to the drab and wretched present after such a glowing vision, it was little wonder that they wailed as if their poor hearts would break into with disillusionment but at least they had seen. The people went on and on and could not stop day or night, hoping perhaps to get a vision or the, of their own dead, or at least to hear the visions of others. They preferred that to rest or food or sleep, and so I suppose the authorities did think they were crazy, but they weren't. They were only terribly unhappy. When the dancing began among the Sioux in 1890, reservation officials reported it as disturbing and unstoppable. They believed that it had been instigated by Hunk Papa, Teton Sioux's leader. Wait a second. Hunk Papa, Teton Sioux leader, Tatanka Yotanka, sitting bull who had returned with his people in 1881 from exile in Canada. 
He was put under arrest and imprisoned in his home, closely guarded by Indian police. <coughs> Sitting Bull was killed by one of his captors on December 15, 1890. All indigenous individuals and groups living outside designated federal reservations were considered fomenters of disturbance. As the War Department put it, following Sitting Bull's death, military warrants of arrest were issued for leaders such as Bigfoot, who was responsible, yeah, really Bigfoot, who was responsible for several hundred civilian refugees who had not yet turned themselves in to the designated Pine Ridge Reservation. When Bigfoot heard of Sitting Bull's death and that the army was looking for him and his people, 350 Lakotas, 230 of them women and children, he decided to lead them through the sub-zero weather to Pine Ridge to surrender. En route on foot, they encountered U.S. troops. The commander ordered that they be taken to the army camp at Wounded Knee Creek, where armed soldiers surrounded them. Two Hotchkiss machine guns were mounted on the hillside, enough firepower to wipe out the whole group. During the night, Colonel James Forsyth and the 7th, 7th Cavalry, Custer's old regiment, arrived and took charge. These soldiers had not forgotten that Lakota relatives of these starving unarmed refugees had killed Custer and decimated his troops at the Little Bighorn 14 years earlier. Now, 14 years is a long time. With orders to transport the refugees to a military stockade in Omaha, Forsyth added two more Hotchkiss guns trained on the camp, then issued whiskey to his officers. The following morning, December 29, 1890, the soldiers brought the captive men out from their campsites and called for all weapons to be turned in. Searching tents, Soldiers confiscated tools such as axes and knives. <clears throat> Still not satisfied, the officers ordered skin searches. A Winchester rifle turned up. Maybe I misunderstand what a skin search is, but I don't see how a Winchester rifle could be hidden on anybody's skin. But alright, let's go with it. Winchester rifle turned up. Its young owner did not want to part with his beloved rifle, and when the soldiers grabbed him, the rifle fired a shot into the air. The killing began immediately. The Hotchkiss guns began firing a shell a second, mowing down everyone except a few who were able to run fast enough. 300 Sioux lay dead. 25 soldiers were killed in friendly fire. Bleeding survivors were dragged into a nearby church. Being Christmas time, the sanctuary was candlelit and decked with greenery. In the front, a banner read, Peace on Earth and Goodwill to Men. The 7th Cavalry attack on a group of unarmed and starving Lakota refugees attempting to reach Pine Ridge to accept reservation incarceration in the frozen days of December 1890 symbolizes the end of indigenous armed resistance in the United States. The slaughter is called a battle in U.S. military annals. Congressional Medals of Honor were bestowed on 20 of the soldiers involved. Wow, really? A monument was built at Fort Riley, Kansas to honor the soldiers killed by friendly fire. A battle streamer was created to honor the event and added to other streamers that are displayed at the Pentagon, West Point, and army bases throughout the world. <clears throat> 
L. Frank Baum, B. A. U. M., a Dakota Territory settler, later famous for writing The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, edited the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer at the time. Five days after the sickening event at Wounded Knee, on January 3rd, 1891, he wrote, The Pioneer has been declared that has before declared that our only safety depends upon the total extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. This is from the same guy that wrote The Wizard of Oz? Three weeks before the massacre, General Sherman had made clear that he regretted nothing of his three decades of carrying out genocide. In a press conference he held in New York City, he said, Indians must either work or starve. They never have worked. They won't work now, and they will never work. A reporter asked, But should not the government supply them with enough to keep them from starvation? Why, Sherman asked in reply, should the government support 260,000 able-bodied campers? No government that the world has ever seen has done such a thing. The reaction of one young man to wounded knee is representative but also extraordinary. Plenty horses. Plenty horses, I guess that's a proper name attended the Carlisle School from 1883 to 1888, returning home stripped of his language, facing the dire reality of the genocide of his people with no traditional or modern means to make a living. He said, There was no chance to get a employment, nothing for me to do whereby I could earn my board and clothes, no opportunity to learn more and remain with the whites. It disheartened me, and I went back to live as I had before going to school. Historian Philip Deloria notes, The greatest threat to the reservation program was the disciplined Indian who refused the gift of civilization and went back to the banker, as Plenty Horses tried. But it wasn't simple for Plenty Horses to find his place. As Deloria points out, he had missed the essential period of Lakota education, which takes place between the ages of 14 and 19. Due to his absence and Euro-American influence, he was suspect among his own people, and even that world was disrupted by colonialist chaos and violence. Still plenty horses returned to traditional dress, grew his hair long, and participated in the ghost dance. He also joined a band of armed resistors, and they were present at Pine Ridge on December 29, 1890, when the bloody bodies were brought in from the Wounded Knee Massacre. A week later, he went out, he went out with 40 other mounted warriors who accompanied Sioux leaders to meet Lieutenant Edward Casey for possible negotiations. The young warriors were angry, none more than plenty horses, who pulled out from his group and got behind Casey and shot him in the back of his head. Army officials had to think twice about charging plenty horses with murder. They were faced with the corollary of the recent army massacre at Wounded Knee in which the soldiers received congressional medals of honor for their deeds. At trial, Plenty Horses was acquitted due to the state of war that existed. Acknowledging a state of war was essential in order to give legal cover to the massacre. As a late manifestation of military action against indigenous peoples, Wounded Knee stands out. Deloria notes that in the preceding years, the Indian warrior imagery so prevalent in U.S. American society was being replaced with 
docile, pacified Indians started out on the road to civilization. Luther Standing Bear, for example, recounts numerous occasions on which the Carlisle Indian Industrial School students were displayed as docile and educable Indians. The Carlisle Band played at the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883 and then toured several churches. Students were carted around East, East Coast cities. Standing Bear himself was placed on display in Wanamaker's Philadelphia department store, locked in a glass cell in the tower of the store, and set to sorting and pricing jewelry. Wow. I'm going to end the episode there on that down note. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, hit that like and subscribe button. And tune in to the next episode. And we'll finish that chapter. Thanks for joining me.